Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. The White House has released their offer for an immigration deal. Their proposal gives so-called dreamers essentially everything they said they wanted, legalization and a path to citizenship. So millions of people who broke our laws to get here would receive amnesty. Very few of the president's supporters voted for that when they put him in office last year, and some of them are upset about it. And the left, what's their reaction like? Well, having gotten pretty much exactly what they demanded, they're enraged. Not only is Trump's amnesty offer not enough, they say, it is evidence of a racist plot. According to the ACLU, quote, the only community that benefits from this supposed generosity are white supremacists. United We Dream, that's one of the largest pro-amnesty groups, called the proposal, quote, a white supremacist ransom note. The columnist Sean King said the plan proved that, quote, the current operating philosophy of Trump and the White House is white supremacy. Immigration activist Eddie Vail called the proposal a legislative burning cross. And the senior Democrat in the House of Representatives said this. Last night, the president put forth a plan. That plan is a campaign to make America white again. They are changing the character of our country by what they are putting forth. They bring a tear to the eye of the Statue of Liberty, and they bring fear to the hearts of people who are here playing by the rules. We could go on and on and on. It's everywhere today. You see the point. They're telling you this plan is something the Klan could have produced and probably did. Okay, but is it? We took those charges seriously because we felt we should, and we decided to take a close look at what the White House has actually proposed. We found that the plan may be many things, not all of them good, by the way, but it definitely isn't a form of white nationalism, not unless that term now has the opposite meaning. Let's go through it. The White House proposal would legalize about two million people who currently have no right to be here. That's a lot of people. For perspective, 13 U.S. states have populations smaller than that. Barack Obama never enacted an amnesty that big. How many of those beneficiaries are white? Now, keep in mind, that would be the central question in any plan crafted by white supremacists, obviously. Well, let's see. Almost none of them. Hmm. Two million more non-white people in this country, that's more than the total population of Delaware or Nebraska, doesn't sound much like a legislative burning cross. But there's more. The proposal would also continue the current system of chain migration until the backlog of applicants has been exhausted. That would take years and years. What countries will be the top beneficiaries of this new arrangement under the Trump plan? Well, if you guessed Finland, Norway, the Swedish national sauna team, nope, guess again, no European countries are on that list, not one. Instead, the plan would admit nearly a million more immigrants from Mexico and hundreds of thousands more from India. Also Vietnam, Bangladesh, the Dominican Republic, and China, the Philippines too. The plan would even bring in more than 50,000 additional immigrants from Haiti, the country the president supposedly hates. Surprised you shouldn't be. No matter what the race baiters on television are telling you, no majority white countries send large numbers of immigrants to the United States and haven't in 50 years. That would not change under this proposal. A white nationalist plot? In the history of dumb and dishonest Washington talking points, that may be the dumbest and most dishonest of all. And it's poisonous, too. It makes people hate each other, and it further divides this country. And we do not need more of that. The people who are repeating it ought to be ashamed of themselves, though, of course, they're not. They have to know they're lying. Then again, maybe they don't know they're lying. Maybe they've actually convinced themselves their rhetoric is true. It's possible the Democratic Party really has gone that insane. Their new position as the, is that it's immoral to restrict any kind of immigration from any country, in any amount, for any reason ever. Even enforcing our own existing laws, the ones that they voted for and passed in Congress, is now tantamount to a hate crime. Nancy Pelosi has been making that case for months. Now, the public doesn't agree with any of this, so by definition, Democrats are extremists on the subject. They don't care. This is their new electoral strategy. These are their new voters, whatever it takes. Joseph Arce is an immigrant and a former dreamer, and she joins us tonight, I believe, from Los Angeles. Joseph, thanks a lot for coming on. Thanks for having me on again, Tucker. So, um, look, there may be things about this plan you don't like. There are definitely things that I don't like about it. But it's hard to see how a plan that gives legalization, amnesty, and a path to citizenship for more than 2 million people here illegally, none of them white, is white supremacy. How does that work? 
Well, I think we have to take a step back and look at this from the beginning. The reason why we're in this chaos situation uh, of, of young people's lives being on the line is because the president rescinded DACA, the program that gave undocumented young people the ability to work and go to school and drive and pay taxes. Uh, he ended that program, and that is why we're in this situation. And let's be well, very can, clear. Can I, so, so, hold on. So, wait, hold on. Since, hold on. Since you want to do that because, and spew prop. Hang on. Wait, no, stop. Hang no, no, no. On. No, no, just, I'm going to ask you a, a question, though, slow. And so no, now no, it's I, my turn no. to speak. I don't, I don't believe it is. Right? I want to ask you a question about the discussion today, not about the roots of DACA, which I'm happy to debate with you in some other forum. I want to ask about the response today to this proposal released last night, which is that it's white supremacy. And I would like you to tell me if well, you I'm believe it is, an and if so, how. You would let me. If you could give me a crisp well, answer and not filibuster, I'd appreciate it. Listen. It was Donald Trump who ended the DACA program, and he did so because he wanted to hold hostage and use as bargaining chips the lives of 800,000 undocumented people who have been here their entire lives, who are American in every single way. And now what we're trying to do is to create a second class citizen. OK, that's what this that's what this program does. Okay. It says so are you that not the going dreamers to answer can my become. Question? This is giving people I, who are here illegally are getting amnesty and a path to citizenship, which is what you've been asking for, and you're calling that white supremacy. None of those people yes, are white, so how price? is it white supremacy? But at what price? I'm not calling it white supremacy. I don't think those words have come out of my mouth. They've come out of the mouth of I'm not calling the it white ranking Democrat. All. What I am saying is okay. that this this plan, what it does is it creates a second class citizen because it says that the dreamers can become citizens themselves, but they cannot sponsor their parents. They cannot sponsor their siblings. And those rights are different than the rights that you have. And you just said earlier that this plan, the two million people, that none of them are white, which is untrue because there are undocumented white people. There are 50,000 undocumented Irish people living in New York City. Sure. So there no, are there are. You know, no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. They're not covered by this. So that, that's my only point. You're absolutely right. There are definitely undocumented there white immigrants. There are dreamers who are white, Tucker. Oh, I'm sure there, there are, are but it's an indefinite. In I, I absolutely believe you. It's just, a, it's an indefinite. Look, I, I don't care, actually, about it's the race fact. of you don't the have dreamers to believe me it's a fact I, I do believe you my only point is that what you're seeing today is not an expression of white supremacy so i wish you and your friends would stop making that point because it's a lie and it's divisive that's my only point and because it, it's not true and it, it makes people hate each other do you understand what plan, i'm saying it is a plan that makes it is a plan that would potentially make 2 million people who are mostly people of color have less rights than white citizens so that is oh. racist. Okay, so it's racist I, to. I, so you a, sneak, I, you come in the a, country illegally as you did. You have a moral right to well, let your first relatives of all, I come I did not too? come into the country illegally. Let's get the facts straight. I came to the U.S. on a plane on a tourist visa. So I did not come into this country. Oh, illegally. I thought that you overstayed. I'm sorry, I totally misunderstood your bio. I, I did that overstay you were... my visa, but oh, I did you not did. come oh. into the country illegally. Oh, you were here illegally. Okay. So I guess that's what I just said. But my and the point other is, point that you're missing if you here are is here illegally, a two year old you... cannot break the law. It was but their the parents, parents who brought them to this country. The parents not, who brought them no to this country. Their own. Right. So you're saying that the parents who brought them to this country now have a moral right to become citizens also. And I'm wondering where that right comes from. Listen, if if I, become, question. I am now a U.S. citizen and if I want my mother to be able to come visit me and to be able to come be with me as a United States citizen, I should have that right. You have hold that on, right. Hold right? On. No, if no, you no, had wait, a mother so, 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 who lived in a different country, if, if, you would be able to sponsor so her. So you sneak into the country, you bring your child, that child gets citizenship and now you have a right to citizenship because you're the one who caused this problem that parent in the first place by bringing again, your child here illegally, back, but I, I have to, as a citizen, give you citizenship? How does that work exactly? No, but why should I be for that? Going back to the point I was making at the beginning of the segment, which How is about that you the reason my question? we are in this situation is because the president ended DACA, and then he tasked Congress no, 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 with coming up with a solution you wanna, you to You want to have that debate, DACA but problem. let's talk about... To, look, now actually, we are, now you're not answering my question. That dreamer lives should pay well, you don't for a have an billion answer. dollar No, no. Wall. So you're saying if I sneak into someone else's country and bring my child, and the people of that country are kind enough to give that child citizenship, that I somehow deserve it too, because why? Why? That's a simple question. Why don't you give me a simple answer? I'm going to tell you why. 
The reason why is because if these people become United States citizens, as they would under this plan, they should have the rights of as every other American citizen has. Why okay. should this person, if we're making them citizens, why because should they have less rights? Because you came illegally, so that that's why, we're saying that and we don't want to reward table, that behavior. Then they should have the same rights as every other United States citizen. Let me ask that's you really, re really quick. So the ACLU s uh, described this as the supposed generosity of giving citizenships to people who are here illegally. Do you think it's generous of the United States to give citizenship to people who came here illegally? Do you think it's generous? I think that we are we are trying to talk about two different things. Right? No, we're talking, trying to talk about, this I'm asking not, you a simple uh, question. Do you not, think it's generous to give people who are here illegally citizenship? I don't think that it's generous to oh, separate families and okay. create second class I citizens. No, I, I don't. I don't know why don't we would bring in people who are not grateful separated. for the privilege of being an American citizen. You're definitely in that category too. But Julissa, by the way. Thank you. Okay, we're out of time. Thanks. Ann Coulter is a columnist and author of Adios America, as well as many other books, and she joins us tonight. And thanks for coming on. So you have Thank a you. great piece uh, on Lindsey Graham, who won the 2016 Republican nomination, as you know, <laughs> and as a result of that, has a right to impose his immigration views on the country. How did that work? <laughs> First, I want to say, boy, Donald Trump is right. These dreamers are fabulous. They're great. They're fantastic. I can't wait for them to be our fellow citizens. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think everybody's wondering, where did Lindsey Graham come from? Who nominated him to be negotiating this? He ran for president. Um, he got literally zero votes, um, was the first and, and most vicious in attacking Donald Trump, the candidate. So how is it that he's the one in this? Uh, why does he have a, a seat at the table at all on immigration negotiations, much less, you know, he's the leader of what the Republicans stand for. And, you know, as I say in my column, it does make a any any normal observer think the fix is in. Why are other Republican senators allowing this? If it had been back during the Iraq war, um, Republicans wouldn't have allowed anti-war Republican Chuck Hale Hagel to go and right. say, oh, he represents our views on the war. We're going to send him. And no, they'd say, no, not him. Don't talk to him. Um, why is the media talking to him? Why is the president talking to him? He doesn't represent us. But the donors want the cheap labor. I mean, the one thing, Tucker, that's going to be fun if we if we lose this um, is is watching all of these short-sighted, idiotic businessmen um, try to do business in a country run by the likes of Kamala Harris and Nancy Pelosi. Yeah, that will be amusing, uh, but sad for the rest of us. So, but but if there's a deeper question about democracy here. So, if the public has been clear in poll after poll about what it wants and what it doesn't want on the question of immigration, and it went to the trouble of electing Donald Trump against all odds and all predictions, <laughs> just to express that view, and it still can't get what it demonstrably wants in immigration, is it possible for the public to have a say in this? No, it's amazing. I mean, it, it is beyond what you just described. I was looking through Nexus transcripts today. The fact that Donald Trump is president it, it was utterly implausible. It's like a Hollywood movie. And this isn't the first time. I, I mean, you keep hearing these phony polls being cited by the media showing that Americans love dreamers. They love them, just like that one you interviewed. Who couldn't love her? Um, they love them. But every time they have an actual ballot, every time for 20 years now, they will vote against bail for illegals, against government services for illegals. They'll vote for Donald Trump. They'll vote um, for English as, as, as the national language when they're um, this Harvard poll that just came out shows more Americans would like zero immigration than our current immigration policy. But the way they, they pull off these phony polls is by, I mean, I didn't read, need to read Saul Alinsky to know that this is not a good way to take a poll. They personalize it. They say, oh, do you want to deport Juanita the maid? They're, they're, they, they make it about a specific person. No, I want questions like, do you want more or less immigration? Do you think people who break the law should be able to um, become citizens and start collecting welfare right away? Um, do you think we should be dumb millions of low-wage workers on the country, which is going to come back. I mean, Trump may yeah. think he is he is a genius, and in some ways he is. He in a, has an uncanny sense for what are popular issues. That's why he won. He may be able to roll over the never-Trumpers, but if he continues down this line, former Trumpers is going to be a much more difficult category for him. You just think in a democracy, you can't ignore what people want forever, or else you're going to get a pretty bad backlash, I think. And thank you for coming on. I appreciate that.
Thank you. Hillary Clinton may have taken a page, seems like she did, from the Lisa Bloom book by protecting a staffer accused of sexual harassment. We know you're shocked. Look at all the details next. Hillary Clinton was pretty clear on the campaign trail. Indeed, unambiguous alleged victims of sexual abuse should be believed always and everywhere. Reports of sexual assault need to be treated with the seriousness, professionalism, and fairness they deserve. I want to send a message to every survivor of sexual assault. Don't let anyone silence your voice. You have the right to be heard. You have the right to be believed. And we're with you. We're with you. Pretty clear about that rule, but there was an exception she didn't mention, and it's for people who work for Hillary Clinton or who are married to her. A new report from the New York Times says that in 2008, Hillary Clinton personally intervened to keep advisor Bernd Strider on her campaign team after he was accused of sexually harassing another staffer. He was not fired. Instead, he was reportedly sent to counseling. The other staffer was transferred to a new role. Lisa Booth frequently co-hosts Outnumbered here on the Fox News Channel, and she joins us tonight. Lisa, thanks for coming on. Hi, Tucker. So I try not to do Hillary Clinton stories because she's not running. She's not a factor in American life anymore. Right. But this subject is at the center of our conversation, and Hillary Clinton, I think, has been an advocate for her position for many years. Are you a little bit stunned that someone who would say, always believe the victim, would do this? No, I mean, I find it completely unsurprising because just to point out the obvious here, Hillary Clinton's a fraud. I mean, her words, oh, good point. no, but her, her words are completely meaningless and they've long been completely meaningless. And she's only an advocate for herself, positions or people that are politically advantageous to her at the time that she needs them to be. I mean, we saw this throughout the campaign trail as well. And I think this was one of the crucial reasons why she was so disconnected to voters and failed to win over so many voters, particularly the working class, because they knew her words were meaningless and her promises were empty. But on this, look, if Hillary Clinton, you know, says one thing to private equity people in a speech and the other to farmers in Iowa, I get it. But this subject is central to her persona, sexual harassment, abuse, assault. I mean, you'd think she could at least crack down in her own office. But uh, Tucker, I mean, it should be unsurprising in the sense of she also had her husband alongside on the campaign trail with her. Her husband's long been accused of, you know, various uh, things from rape to sexual assault uh, and, and onward. And she still had him on the side with her. She's also been known to go after his victims as well. And so, again, it goes back to this basic premise that her words are meaningless uh, and she's not to be believed. And again, this was her bigger issue with voters, and particularly voters who wanted a fighter or wanted an advocate, wanted someone that they could trust that would actually fight for the people I that know, needed. But look, uh, I try not to judge because you know we're all hypocrites. We all fall short of our own standards. Not to that degree, though. But Tucker, this is but this really is like PETA operating a kill shelter. I mean, if Hillary Clinton is covering up sexual harassment in her own office, that's just toxic levels of hypocrisy. How do the Democrats stand that? Well, I mean, it's the same thing as Kirsten Gillibrand, who embraced Bill Clinton when it was politically expedient for her and then threw him away when it was, again, politically expedient for her as she was looking ahead at 2020. She did that with the uh, Al Franken controversy. So I don't think this should be a shock. You also have one of the Clinton top donors. Uh, what is it? Susie Bell uh, Hopkins or Tompkins, or Tompkins uh, who paid for Lisa Bloom's firm, paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to accusers and also to, accuse, uh, to encourage accusers uh, accusing President Trump of sexual uh, assault allegations, um, who then went after individuals who called Al Franken out for his sexual harassment uh, allegations <laughs> as well. So I don't think it's a shock here for there to be this hypocrisy among liberals it's or anyone a, really, but I also don't think that you should be surprised yep. or anyone watching should be surprised I know, that Hillary Clinton has a completely double standard or her words are meaningless. It's, it's almost too much though. Thank you for that education. Lisa Booth, I Thank appreciate Thank you, Tucker. It. I'm still shocked. I'm not. A congressional <laughs> Democrat slamming his own party. He says they care more about elite issues like gay marriage than the fate of DACA recipients. Ooh, a brewing civil war within the party. We'll tell you more in a minute. Chuck Schumer's deal to end the government shutdown upset a lot of Democrats, but maybe none was more upset than Illinois Democratic Congressman Luis Gutierrez. Gutierrez said the deal only happened because immigrants are Hispanic and not gay. We're quoting now. 
If the Republicans said we are ending same-sex marriage, but we promised Democrats a vote later, you think Democrats would say yes? This shows me that when it comes to immigrants, Latinos and their families, Democrats are still not willing to go to the mat to allow people in my community to live in our country legally. Chadwick Moore is a journalist. He's been following this, and he joins us tonight for some perspective. Chadwick, good to see you. Hey, good to see you too, Tucker. So I, I think Luis Gutierrez is wrong on most issues, but I, I think he, he's pulling a thread here, and there's some insight at the core of this. What do you think he was saying, and is it right? He's wrong, but he's kind of right. He, you know, the Democrat, the Democratic Party, really, I always say they did, they did very little for gay marriage at all. They essentially were the bureaucrats that pushed the paperwork through once it was politically expedient to do so, once the polls said it was okay. Right. Because they know. were against it. I remember that really well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hillary came out in 2013. It took her that long. Obama, 2012. I mean, he flip-flopped a lot, obviously. However, what Gutierrez is saying, there is something of a truth there in that uh, the, the gay marriage push was very much a uh, upper-class prerogative. It was, right. it was uh, something that vastly white, upper-middle-class gay people were pushing for who attend Democrat galas, who donate to, uh, to uh, congressional members, uh, who, who lobby very hard. So the, the Democratic Party sort of, you know, kept, you know, wouldn't really hold their hand in public for many years with the, with the gay marriage issue. Once gay people sort of did it on their own by winning hearts and minds in American culture on the issue, then they finally threw these people a bone. So Gutierrez's argument is, is sort of one of essentially class. It's, it's, the, it's the rich. I think that's right. No, that's exactly yeah. how I read it. And it's not just gay marriage. It's also global warming, for example, which is right. one of those issues that every Democratic donor feels is central, but that has no relevance at all to people making under 50 grand. They, it doesn't rate for them at all. I wonder if they really care about the DACA recipients, like actually care about them. Well, you know, they really should care about them because what they've learned is that if Americans won't vote for you, you have to import people who will. That's right. why they should really concern yeah, about, be concerned about this issue. Uh, Gutierrez is a really uh, perfect person to be, to be w starting to wage this civil war in the Democratic Party. You know, his district, the 4th District, is, is basically the definition of gerrymandering. If you look it up, uh, it's, it's the most strangely shaped district in the country. It looks like a set of earmuffs. And he basically brought together these two disparate Latino communities that he represents. Uh, and, and if there's one thing that we know about the, the sort of collectivized mentality uh, the, the, of, of the, the collective groups that the left brings together is yes. often they don't really have a lot in common and exactly. they might not even like each other. Exactly. You know, something tells me that a lot of Puerto Ricans and Mexican Americans maybe are a little to the right on social issues of a gender studies professor. I think that's totally right. And one of my least favorite qualities of the left is they assume that all people who sort of look alike are alike, which is, of course, not true. People are very different in this world. But anyway, Chevik, that's a really insightful analysis. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Always a pleasure. Thanks. High school football coach Joe Kennedy lost his job in 2015 after he defied an order to stop praying at the 50-yard line after games. The Ninth Circuit just declined to hear one of his appeals, not surprisingly, given it's the Ninth Circuit. But he says he is planning to take that case all the way to the Supreme Court. Coach Kennedy joins us along with his lawyer, Mike Barry of First Liberty. Nice to see you both. Coach, first to you. Um, were you surprised that the Ninth Circuit refused to hear this? And where does that leave you exactly? I wasn't really surprised. I only go by what I hear from everybody else with the night, you know, that it's, uh, I, it was a long shot to begin with. But yeah. um, where does it leave me is hopefully the Supreme Court, you know, the, somebody will actually hear the case that I have a fair shot with. So, Mike, what's at stake here? I mean, it's not just about one football game or one coach. There's maybe something bigger. Yeah, that's exactly right, Tucker. This, this is an outrageous decision that really sets a dangerous precedent for not just coach, but uh, school employees across the country. This decision, if it's not challenged, means that if you're a, a Jewish employee, you can be fired for wearing a yarmulke. If you're a Muslim employee, you can be fired for wearing a head covering. If you're Catholic and you wear a cross necklace, you can be fired. And, you know, people have been asked, everybody from, you know, the president of the United States to, to former NFL stars have been pouring out support. And folks across the country want to know, you know, what, what can be done about this? What can we do? Uh, we encourage people to go to firstliberty.org to, uh, to support Coach and to get behind this petition to get the Supreme Court to take this well, case. Yeah, and I hope, I hope people will do that. So, um, Coach Kennedy, jog our memory here. Who exactly was offended by what you were doing? How did it get to this place? Yeah, it originally started from a compliment. One of the educators saw what we were doing out on the field and 
paid the uh, school district a compliment, said that what we were doing was awesome. It was good, you know, sportsmanship. So it all came from a compliment. Huh. So, but at along the way, somebody must have been offended by it or you wouldn't have lost your job, right? Only person that I, I, I realized that was really offended was the district lawyers at that time. And they're the ones that are continuing to, you know, fight against me on this. Yes, yeah, so there's no actual victim here. <laughs> <laughs> Just like the most perverse part. Gentlemen, thank you for coming uh, on, and good luck. I hope you make it all the way to the Supreme Court. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Well, law under consideration in the state of California, still a state barely, could send waiters to jail for the crime of murdering their diner. No, no, sorry, just kidding. For offering plastic straws to people. We're going to talk to a fan of that proposal next. Heroin, cocaine, explosives, exotic animals, there are a lot of illegal goods out there. And in the state of California, there could soon be another one, plastic straws. A bill under consideration in the California legislature would punish waiters with a $1,000 fine and up to six months imprisonment if they offer restaurant straws to patrons without being asked for them. It's obviously insane. But Ethan Behrman is a California radio show host and is brave enough to defend it. Ethan, thanks for coming on. So, thanks, Tucker. This uh, penalty is the same, would be the same if passed under California law as the penalty for knowingly transmitting HIV to someone. Giving a straw without being asked is the same punishment. Does that seem a little over the top to you? Well, that is what the law allows, and as you and I both know, that's not how laws are implemented. In this case, the fine would likely be the situation, and as the, an employee of an establishment, it would ultimately be the establishment that pays the fine, not the waiter in this case. We have a severe problem with plastic pollution in right. our oceans. We now have more plastic in the ocean by weight 36 times than the zooplankton. This is a problem. Why do we need more of that? Well, I, I agree. No, it, it's absolutely a problem. The question is, what's the solution? And if you're not intending to send someone to jail for giving out a plastic straw, you probably shouldn't put that in the law as they plan to do. But my question is, if you can get six months imprisonment for giving out a straw, what if you give out a spork or a plastic spoon? Could that be life? I mean, like, what, what would be the proportional penalty for giving out an even meatier piece of plastic to a diner? So this falls under the health and safety code, which has that as the generic punishment across the board for violations of the health and safety code, which is right. why you're making the comparison that you are. In this case, look, California doesn't keep criminals in prison. We're not going to put waiters or shop owners in prison oh. for distributing straws. But the I, issue no, I love is that. So California has a real mean, problem with pollution. Doesn't even plan to enforce any of us. Well, actually, California does have a problem. I don't know if you've been to California recently. Um, oh, wait, you live there. Then you may have That's noticed scenes like this. I'll put them on the screen for our viewers. This is what California looks like in a lot of parts. These are homeless encampments. They're all over the state, including the town that I grew up in, all over the state. And the state does, let's see, nothing. That's plastic, piles of it, garbage. And your state, the one that supposedly cares about pollution, does nothing to clean it up and punishes nobody for doing it. So why are you going after waiters for giving out plastic straws when you have this? Well, I, I think that's an unfair comparison. First off, I have gone out on volunteer teams to do some of the cleanup of what you just showed a picture of in Santa Cruz. There are a lot of concerned citizens that are participating to help clean up the pollution. In this case, we have a very simple solution. There are paper straws. There are reu reusable glass sure. and metal straws. Why are we adding? Tucker, you don't want to live next to a landfill or those pictures that you're putting up there. Well, Let's do what we can to reduce. I don't. To that's why I don't live in California and because the state is becoming a landfill. So I guess, look, I'm not for pollution, and I'm certainly not for litter. I just sense profound irony in the state of California, which is filthy and covered with litter from homeless people and people who are in the country illegally, okay. That's punishing waiters for accidentally giving out straws when they let homeless people throw garbage everywhere. And that's not an exaggeration. If you actually live there, I think you do. You know exactly what I'm talking about. It's everywhere. 
It, it, it is a problem what you're talking about, but those are again <laughs> separate issues. There are also civil liberty issues in terms of taking things away from homeless people, which is what. So why isn't there a civil the liberty courts. issue in not imprisoning a waiter who makes nine dollars an hour for accidentally giving out a straw? Why is the homeless guy well, throwing his garbage around protected, but the waiter isn't? I'm missing this. Yeah, well, those again, separate issues about civil liberties and the penalties for for committing. Well, first off, here's the issue: if you're going to pick on homeless people here in the state of California, I'm not pick Tucker, on them. I want them to stop. Um, if we give them a fine, a we, they're, like they can't pay the fine. We, we have a problem of, of people who need help in the state of California. We have Laura's law that all the counties have not implemented yet. Los Angeles pe just passed Measure H, so they're going to try and build some housing for the homeless people. We are trying to address it, no, which the, means those we are, also those want are to address issues. it with plastic I, pollution. I may agree with some of well, you the solutions. The I don't know. I just know, as a frequent visitor to the state, it's covered in garbage. It's literally dirty, it, and anyone who's been there recently knows that that's true. It's not covered in garbage. Actually, Look, it is. Talker, Drive through Los Angeles. I was just in Union Square in San Francisco We have an issue week. of it's garbage, dirty. but that's absolutely not the case. You go walking along the beaches, Tucker. Look, I know that to be e true. E Ethan, the beaches Ethan, are beautiful here, and the way on. we address that is by addressing source of the no, pollution, no, and no, one of those is plastic straws. Working people who are at the bottom of the we ecosystem in your state, and you're letting the homeless go because they're a protected class. Where the employer is responsible. It's not the employee that's going to be held responsible but, here. Well, you don't, it that's will not be the, law, the establishment that pays the fine. Okay, they go to jail. Okay, but really quick, why again can't we punish the homeless for littering all over the state? Just tell me why. Well, uh, what's happened is we you can't you can't find them. They're, what are they going to pay a fine with? They don't have money to pay a well, fine how do they for buy littering. Drugs? No, they that do the, actually. What do you mean they don't have money? Yes, they do. I mean, are you kidding? Why not punish them in some way? Why not put them in jail? Just like you would the waiter who gives Why up the straw. Why not help them and get them out of their situation of homelessness? The Let's, get the the Let's get them the mental health care they need. Let's get them the addiction care that they need. Let's get them into some housing. Exactly. That's the way you address homelessness, you, not you, punish them. You give the vagrant housing and counseling, but you send the waiter to jail. This is why the middle class is leaving your state. I'm just noting. Waiter's not going to jail, Tucker. Yeah, you know. I hope not. He's always welcome to this show if he does. Easton, thank you. Thanks, so, thanks, Tucker. So CNN just went like so far over the top, even by their own low standards, publishing a piece that supports cuckoldry. What's driving the left's war on normal people? It's everywhere. We'll have details on that. And then at the end of the show, an important investigation into the Botox scandal in a camel pageant in the Middle East. Stay tuned. Want to be a true intellectual man of the future? Become a cuckold. Those are the instructions from CNN. A bizarre propaganda-style article posted to CNN's website recently asserts that, I'm quoting now, cuckolding can be positive for some couples. It's hard to tell what exactly the intent of the article is, except to encourage the breakdown of healthy marriages as they have been understood for, let's see, all of history. There's a common theme on the left which hates the traditional family for reasons that are not really clear. Joe Concha writes about the media for The Hill, and he joins us tonight. Joe, I've seen a lot of weird stuff on CNN, even when I worked there, promoting adultery and, and a, even weirder, cuckoldry. What is that? Well, it's, it's a pattern that I think we've seen for the last three weeks now, Tucker. I mean, think about what we discussed on this show alone. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we had a CNN reporter lighting a bong uh, for somebody on the air. I don't mind if you're reporting on marijuana, but to actually engage in the act, probably not good to look like you're advocating it. And then just uh, two weeks ago, we were talking about various hosts and anchors and guests somehow saying a word that rhymes with spithole 165 times in one day on the air. I mean, that's to the point where you're at the dog eating the wheel of cheese in the refrigerator. You're not even mad. You're impressed that they could actually say that word that many times. And then we get to cuckolding, which is a term that I literally had to look up when a radio producer contacted me yesterday to say if I wanted to join uh, them on the show to talk about. I had never even heard of this before, so I did what everybody else does. I looked it up in the dictionary. And apparently it means to make another man a cuckold by having a sexual relationship with his wife. So, you know, whenever I jumped of going into journalism, I knew I'd be discussing but, this type of topic on this day. But, but I, I mean, to, to tell you, to answer your question, I, I think that I have a theory around this. And that yeah. CNN is struggling greatly from a, a ratings perspective. They could barely average 800,000 people throughout their day and evening. So what you do in those situations is you push the envelope with the envelope with the examples I just described. But the problem is you're now 
appealing to the lowest common denominator, and that's not what CNN but the was and has been for the in, But it's always in, in the system. same direction. It's mm -hmm. toward things that are perverse, disgusting, creepy, weird, unhappy, and against the one thing they hate, which is like an average family. They hate that. What is that about? Why is the left so angry at the family? I don't understand. I really Why don't. are they angry at the family? I, I think it's because Bob Schieffer came up with this, this great study a couple of months ago, and he talked about how one in five journalists now live in New York, Washington, or L.A., yeah. and they're in these bubbles. They're in this same sort of, you use the term a lot, groupthink, and the suburbs, like where I live, and I got my two kids, and I have my wife, and the, the white picket fence, it's not white, it's green, but fine. Uh, I think that that's seen as something that's not hip, not cool, not within yeah, the bubble. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're very hostile to it. Okay, so quickly, um, I guess given all this, it's not that surprising that CNN is one of the most polarizing brands in America. That is not uh, speculation. It's according to a new survey that shows there's a 66-point favorability gap between the right and the left when it comes to CNN. Only Trump hotels, by the way, are mo more polarizing. Uh, what's your quick take on that, Joe? Uh, I would say that, obviously, CNN has been uh, the target uh, of the president more than any other news outlet. And, and yeah. there's a good reason for it. If you look at every study and every analysis that's been done since Donald Trump took office a year ago, uh, the network has been overwhelmingly negative towards the administration, has been the face of the resistance. And if you watch it for more than five minutes, you, you can see what I'm, I'm talking about. Uh, but also, I think it continues to insist that it's objective. And I think that that insults many people people's intelligence. You know, I interviewed Phil Griffin, who's the president of MSNBC, just last year, and he actually said, he joked with me, he said, I wish President Trump would attack us more and give us the free press that CNN gets. So I, I think that that's the issue here, that they've become polarizing because they're taking a stand, and that's not the network that people grew up with right. starting in 1980 through the Gulf Wars. They now see a different network, and I think it, again, to use that term, insults their intelligence when they continue uh, I think that's that exactly objective. right. In the way that, that MSNBC does it, you sort of know what you're getting, but CNN is false, and it drives people bonkers. Me too. Joe, thank you. Have a good cuckolding weekend. Well, thanks, Joe. Saudi Arabia just had a Botox scandal at a camel beauty pageant. We've been on top of the story since the very beginning. The question is, how do you know if a camel is hot or not? We've got an actual world-renowned expert joining us in just a second to answer that critical question about camels. Stay tuned. We close this week with a second look at the most important news story of the past year, perhaps of a generation, the introduction of performance-enhancing drugs into camel beauty contests. Earlier this week, we brought you the news that 12 camels were disqualified at a Saudi camel pageant after they were found to have used Botox. But even without cheating, how do you judge a camel pageant? Patty McHugh is a camel herder, a camel trader, and an all-around dromedary expert. He joins us tonight. Mr. McHugh, thank you very much for joining us. Have you ever seen this kind of doping in the camel community? <laughs> Look, it's a bit of an unusual story, that's for sure, to have Botox put in their lips and their head to make them look nicer. But uh, it's not unusual, I suppose. There's big money, big prestige, and... You know, thousands and thousands of camels at these events. Everybody wants to win, and whatever it takes, I suppose. Yes. I mean, and look, I just want to be clear up front, given the environment in this country, I'm not objectifying camels at all. I mean, I, I appreciate camels for who they are, not just how they look. But how do you tell the difference between an attractive camel and, let's just say, a less attractive camel? Uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. They, they have certain guidelines at these competitions where it's configuration, you know, um, how their ears are pricked, how their lips drop down. And one of the main things in these competitions is how their lip drops down, their bottom lip. So I'd imagine that's where the Botox is being put, if anywhere at all, to make that lip look fuller and nicer. I mean, it's really just a group of people get together and say, this is the criteria and this is what we're going to do. It's a bit of a way of life, I suppose, for them over there. Is a, is a droopy camel lip preferable to a taut camel lip? <laughs> Sounds crazy, doesn't it? Well, in, in their competition rules, I would imagine that's one of the things they look for. They also look for different things like the big humps and the, the ears pricked up and everybody looking happy, you know. But certainly the big droopy lip is um, pretty good. I mean, I think I've, there's a photo there of a, I think it's a five million 
dollar black Saudi camel that's just magnificent and it's got the biggest droopiest slip on the planet you know it's quite yeah. amazing it's a beautiful camel do camels know when you're looking at their humps can they sense it do they what strike when you're looking at their humps 